Hello everyone. So we're now switching from supervised learning to unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning is a really exciting area. It's also a very, very challenging area. So in supervised learning, normally what happened was we got a training set of data and each item in our training set would have a label, maybe a class or a value that we're trying to predict. Um, in contrast, in unsupervised learning, we get a a data set, but the items aren't labeled. We don't have a target value that we're trying to predict. And we want to make sense of the data of this unlabeled um, data set. And this video will look at a few examples of different tasks which try to make sense of, of unlabeled data sets. And specifically, I'll just um, introduce at a high level um, dimensionality reduction and clustering to very important unsupervised learning tasks. In supervised learning, we normally get a data set. And the data set has some input vectors, um, which we've denoted as X in previous uh, videos. So you would have your first training item X1, you would have your second training item X2, and so on up to Xn. And each one of these input vectors, this is a set of features for your first training item, for your second training item, each one of these feature vectors will be paired with the target value that you're trying to predict. And we've denoted that as Y. So you would have a Y1 for your first training item, a Y2 for your second training item, and so on up to Yn for your nth training item. The goal in supervised learning is to take this training data set and build a model which can take in an unseen feature vector and then predict what the target value will be for that new input, which we haven't seen before. In regression, the task will be to predict some continuous value y, and in classification, the task will be to predict some discrete label uh, y, where each of the inputs belongs to uh, one of a finite set of classes. So as an example, let's quickly look at binary classification. Let's say that each of our input vectors consists of two features, a x1 and a x2. And let's say that our output variable y can take on one of uh, just two values. Either um, the input is in uh, this class, the orange square class or it is in the green triangle class. And let's say our data set looks like this. So for instance, this might be the fifth training point. So this um, vector there would be x5. Okay, and that um, training vector is of class uh, green triangle. And from this data, we might want to train a model which can predict what type of class an unseen input is. And we can use um, different types of models for doing this. We've looked at decision trees, we've looked at um, logistic regression. If we are uh, using logistic regression, then maybe the model puts a decision boundary around here. And everything on, on this side of the decision boundary is classified as a as a green triangle and everything on this side is classified as orange square. That is supervised learning where each one of our input vectors um, is paired with a corresponding label on the output side. Let's see how that compares to unsupervised learning. In the case of unsupervised learning we also have a data set of course so we might have our first uh, feature vector, our second feature vector, and so on, up to our nth um, feature vector. But instead of having labels for each of these vectors, as we did for supervised learning, we simply just get the data um, as it is here. So they're not labeled, it's an unlabeled data set. And we might want to make sense of this data. So um, for instance, let's pretend that again, we've got two features, uh, x1 and x2. And let's say our data looks like this. So in this case, um, I've drawn all the data just with a blue circle, a little blue circle. Some of them are really ugly like this one, but they're all basically unlabeled. You have no way of distinguishing 
this circle, from this circle, from this circle, apart from the values that x1 and x2 takes on. So there's no y target value with any of them. And that's why they're all drawn um, with, with these blue ugly circles. And what we might want to do is we might want to look at this data in this form and try and make sense of, of the data. We might try and find some structure. And if you look at this made up data set here, you can clearly see that there is some structure in the data. There's, for example, a little grouping here, a grouping here and a grouping here. So the idea behind unsupervised learning is basically to see what can we learn just from the data itself without um, any labels. It's a really powerful idea because actually a lot of the time um, we have access to just way more data without labels than with, um, with data with labels. Um, but it's also super challenging because it's actually um, sometimes quite ill-defined exactly what you're looking for. In supervised learning, we know exactly um, in this case that the goal is the goal of the game is basically to classify things as um, orange squares or green triangles. But in unsupervised learning, when you get a data set like this, it's much harder to see exactly what the, what the goal is. Nevertheless, there's a number of things we can, um, we can do by just looking at the data. And we'll look at two specific examples of unsupervised learning tasks. Um, in this video, I'm just giving a high level um, introduction to, to these two tasks. And then in um, follow up videos, we'll go into a bit more detail. The first unsupervised task, which we'll briefly look at in this video is dimensionality reduction. So here you're given a data set. I basically just print out the vectors in, in Python. Um, normally what we would do is we would write this first uh, vector, we would write that as x1, and we use the convention of column vectors, so we would have 0 0.59, um, all of the values up to 3.07, like this. Um, and so, so this one would be the first um, um, data point, this would be the second item, third item, and so on. And we've got uh, a number of these of these vectors. And I show some of the features. Actually, this is um, this is some real data. And actually, each of the vectors has um, 256 different features. So we could write that x, our data, uh, has a dimensionality of 256. And we're just given this data set. Uh, and now we basically want to do something with it. So I, I guess in this case, it's actually important to know something about where the data comes from. And that's, that's often the case in unsupervised learning. So um, this data is actually uh, a real data set where each one of these uh, vectors actually represents a spoken word. And I won't go into the details of exactly how we get the features for each of the spoken words, but um, you can just know that each of these vectors is a 256 dimensional vector representing one word. Some of the words are the same. So maybe X1 can be the word apple and X5 can also be the word apple. X2 might be another word running. Um, X3 might be dog and so on. Um, we're not given the labels. We don't actually know which word is being said or which word is represented for each of the vectors because this is an unsupervised task. We're just given this data set with all these different vectors. If we were in a supervised setting, we might know that, oh, this um, first item corresponds to the word apple. Okay, and then we could maybe train a classifier that reads in uh, an unseen X vector and then predicts which word is being said. But that's not the case here. We're just given this, um, this data set. This is actually a problem that I work on in my own research. So where would this occur? So imagine you have a robot that's in our house. Um, the robot doesn't know the language that's spoken around it. It doesn't know the words that's spoken around it, but it wants to learn the language of, um, of the other people living in the house. And all that the robot observes is basically these vectors, each vector representing a different word, but the robot doesn't know uh, what the words are. 
So this is our actual data set. There's actually around 500 different vectors. So we go up to uh, uh, X 500 here. Um, what do we want to do with this data? Maybe the first thing that we want might want to do is we might just want to look at the data. Um, and in this case, it's actually quite difficult because I have no idea how to visualize something in 256 dimensions. Um, for my brain, that's, that's just really hard. So maybe one thing we would want to do is we might want to map each of these vectors to something in two dimensions. So we want to take X and we want to change it through some mapping to another vector, maybe let's call that Z, in uh, two dimensions. And what we would like is that this Z vectors, these Z vectors will still capture some properties um, of the data set. And that's actually the goal of dimensionality reduction. Um, you're given a data set, and then from that data set, you want to learn some mapping, which allows you to take an input in the original feature space and then map it to another vector uh, in a lower dimensional space. And of course, this mapping will throw away some information and the information you throw away, that will basically depend on the type of problem that you're looking at, but also the particular dimensionality reduction approach that you use. So if we apply dimensionality reduction to this data set using a particular method, what happens? This is actually the output from a particular uh, dimensionality reduction technique called um, TSNI. Um, and what we've done here is we've mapped each of our vectors from the previous slide, each of the XNs, we've, which uh, were in 256 dimension, we've mapped this to a ZN in uh, two dimensions. And that allows us to plot the data on a two dimensional um, plot that you can see on a screen, for example, on YouTube. Um, and each one of these points is corresponds to one of the X's um, that we fed into this algorithm. And that X was changed from a 256 dimensional vector to a two dimensional vector. And that allows us to look at this um, at the data set. So this is one thing that we would often want to do with dimensionality reduction. Dimensionality reduction um, allows us to visualize high dimensional data. Okay, so this is one particular uh, use case um, is visualization. And TSNI in particular is a very, very good uh, dimensionality reduction technique specifically developed um, to some extent for visualizing data. While it was very hard if you just looked at the 500 data points each 256 dimensions, it was very hard to make sense of that. If you look at this um, plot here, you can already start to see some structure in the data. Dimensionality reduction can also be used in other cases. So even in a supervised setting where we've got a bunch of input vectors and some target values that we're trying to predict, sometimes it might be computationally too expensive to fit a model directly on uh, your original high dimensional vectors. And in that case, what you can do is you can use an unsupervised dimensionality reduction technique to first take your uh, original inputs and then map that to some lower dimensional inputs. And then you can fit the machine learning model on those lower dimensional inputs. So dimensionality reduction can be useful in cases where computational cost is uh, a particular issue. Um, I should note that it's actually quite important to just think carefully um, and not just blindly do dimensionality reduction in all cases. Very often it's, it's better to first try and fit a model on the original data and then see what happens before you're trying to save computational cost without that actually being so important for your particular um, situation. Nevertheless, dimensionality reduction is very, very useful uh, in cases where computational cost is uh, very, very important. Another use case for dimensionality reduction is just in compression. So if you have a very large data set of millions and millions of different points, different items, and each of the items have a very large dimensionality, then it might be simply too 
expensive to save all of that data. And in that case, it might be useful to map your inputs to a lower dimensionality and then just save the data uh, in the lower dimensionality. So the third use case of um, dimensionality reduction is uh, compression. And different dimensionality reduction techniques might be appropriate depending on which particular problem you're trying to solve. I've mentioned that this plot was generated using TSNE. We will look in a follow-up um, video to one of the fundamental dimensionality reduction techniques called um, principal component analysis, and we will step through the details of that technique. The other unsupervised learning task that we will look at is called clustering. So in clustering, the goal is to group your um, items so that each group contains items which are similar to each other. And these items should be different from items that are um, put into a different group. So if you look at this example, for instance, um, remember these are actually all each, each of these items represents a spoken word. So this is one spoken word, this is another spoken word, this is another spoken word. Some of the words are the same, but there are actually many different types of, of words in this um, relatively small data set of 500 points. And maybe I could ask you, how many words do you guess uh, there is in this data set? It's a little bit hard to see, but if I had to guess, I would say like maybe all of this stuff here, all of these items, they might be the same word. Maybe these items here might be the same word. Not sure, maybe these items, um, maybe these ones. Then you have a odd uh, looking cluster. Maybe the cluster runs somewhere here. I'm just, I'm just guessing at this point, right? Uh, and maybe there's a cluster running, running somewhere here. So the goal in clustering is basically to take your data and to partition it in groups like this. And this group, the items within this group are more similar to each other than they are to the items, for example, in the group here. So in the example here, um, this might be a robot that observed different words that said it in its environment. It doesn't know what the words are, right? It doesn't have a label for the different words. But by just looking at the data and maybe applying a clustering technique, it can say, listen, I don't know what this word is, but I do think it's the same as this word and this word. And those words are different from the words, for example, in the cluster down here. Again, there are a number of different clustering techniques and, and we'll look at a few of them. So apart from this language learning example, clustering has many applications. Um, imagine you're collecting data from um, tissue samples, um, maybe for breast cancer detection, and you have a number of measurements, a number of features for different tissue samples. Maybe you would want to cluster that data to see if there are maybe subcategories of different types of of, of breast cancer. Maybe you're in marketing and you've got uh, data from different types of, of users and you want to see whether some users are similar to other users and then maybe recommend things that, um, that other like-minded users have, have chosen. One area where clustering is often used these days is in social network analysis. So if, for example, this is a plot of um, I think a Facebook friend network. Um, and you could maybe see that uh, here we might think that this is a cluster and this is a cluster and maybe this is a cluster. This video has introduced unsupervised learning by looking at just two particular tasks. And in the next videos, we will actually go into these two tasks, clustering and dimensionality reduction in a bit more detail, looking at some specific techniques.